thanks for dropping by to my new video on diabetes insipidus. So as always, let's come up with a very generalized definition of diabetes insipidus. Uh, so diabetes insipidus is anytime you have uh, a problem with uh, ADH. So your ADH is going to be low. And as you know, ADH is also known as vasopressin. And this can be related to two separate factors, either uh, decreased production, which is going to be known as uh, central diabetes insipidus, or decreased uh, response to ADH, which is going to be known as nephrogenic. So this is going to be the, uh, the overall definition. We're going to go into more detail uh, in a little bit, but first what I want to do is I want to cover uh, the general physiology of ADH uh, and what it does and how it's secreted, because that's going to be important to understanding uh, the pathology related to it. So uh, real quick, we're going to put up a pituitary gland. And so uh, just to kind of get you oriented, uh, here is going to be the hypothalamus. Um, uh, at the bottom here, we're going to have the uh, anterior pituitary, which uh, secretes uh, uh, the, some of the hormones such as uh, you know, gonadotropin releasing hormone, TSH, uh, FSH, LH, all of those, which we're not going to deal with the anterior pituitary at all here. And then you have the posterior pituitary, which uh, we are going to deal with here. This is the actual part of the pituitary gland that, that secretes ADH as well as oxytocin. So, um, so how does this whole process work? So in order for the uh, ADH to become secreted, um, first there has to be uh, the osmoreceptor here. So here's an osmoreceptor. Uh, going to the hypothalamus. So this osmoreceptor has to detect a uh, uh, a high osmolality in the plasma. And so this, uh, whenever you have this high os osmolality, uh, the signal is going to go from this receptor to the hypothalamus and to a few different nuclei. So here I'm just drawing, you know, some th these these are nuclei of the hypothalamus. It's spe more specifically the supraoptic and the paraventricular nuclei are primarily responsible for actually making the ADH. And so you have to remember here, uh, when it comes to ADH, unlike in the anterior pituitary where the actual hormone is uh, produced here and secreted here, and um, the hypothalamus produces the just the tropic factors which stimulate them, uh, with the posture pituitary, the actual ADH and oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus. So you get the production of hypo, uh, of ADH here, and then this 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 uh, ADH will then be stored in the posture pituitary. So again, the posture pituitary is not producing any ADH whatsoever, and this is going through a specialized por uh, vessel system known as the portal vessels. So it's kind of going from a vein to a vein. Uh, so you can you can probably look into that uh, more. I don't think that's too important to discuss here. So uh, what happens uh, when it's when it's in the posterior pituitary? So it's going to be stored there for a while, uh, and then when it's secreted, it's going to uh, act uh, in two primary uh, places. So one is going to be the V1 receptor. This V1 receptor is located on the vessels, and it causes vasoconstriction. Uh, and so again. When we're talking, why would you want to vasoconstrict? Again, if your if your osmolarity is high, uh, there could be many different factors that can cause that. One of them is uh, low volume, uh, so you're losing water for whatever reason, and so oftentimes that can also lead to a low blood pressure. And so this this is why the ADH is also going to stimulate some vasoconstriction, just in case there is some uh, blood pressure issues, because your body definitely wants to maintain that uh, blood pressure as much as it can. So what the ADH is also going to stimulate is going to be the V2 receptors, which are located right here. So uh, how does the V2 um, receptors work? And this is going to be our prim primary uh, focus here. So here we have the uh, nephron here. Uh, you have the glomerulus, uh, a proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. So uh, as you know, as you're probably aware, the collecting ducts has uh, you know, a number of cells here. Uh, which I'm drawing here, and um, among those cells is you have the principal cells. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a principal cell here, and this principal cell is where the site of action of ADH is. So um, within this uh, principal cell, uh, so here for real quick, this is the lumen, so this is where the urine is going, and this side is the blood. So on this side is where the urine is going to eventually leave, and on this side is where you're going to have the... Uh, uh, blood. Uh, so anything that comes here is going to be considered reabsorbed. Everything here is going to be considered uh, as, as gone into the urine. Okay, so what do we have inside of these uh, principal cells? Well, we have these vesicles that are lined with little, uh, you can say, channels. And these channels are called the aquaporin 
two channels, and that's what's the green dot here. So these are all aquaporin two channels. Now what happens is ADH comes in from the blood, it goes into the cell, and it's going to activate that vesicle. And what's going to happen is the vesicle is going to go out to the membrane of the luminal side of the cell, and it's going to insert those aquaporin two channels right inside to the lumen. Now, as soon as that occurs, water is going to rush in from the lumen inside the cell and from the cell in, in, towards the, I guess, interstitial and then the blood to be more accurate. And so why would it, I mean, this isn't a pump, by the way, this is a channel. So why would it get, why, why would it tend to do that? Again, it's going to go down the uh, osmotic gradient or, or it's going to go to, uh, from the low concentration to the, sorry, from the high concentration of water to the lower concentration of water. So what causes that? Well, again, if you go back up here in the loop of Henle, uh, you have the medullary area which has a high osmolality, which in other words means a very low water concentration. And so uh, what creates this high, and this osmolality goes as high as 1200 at times. And what creates this high osmolality? Well, if you remember at the uh, thick ascending loop of Henle, you have the sodium chloride uh, to potassium channel, which is always going to be pumping the solutes in, creating that high osmolarity. And so when you have that osmolarity, as the water rushes in, uh, rushes through the collecting tubules, it's going to rush into the interstitium and eventually get back into the blood flow. And so uh, what you're going to end up with, uh, with, with all of the uh, water uh, rushing in, is your urine osmolality is going to steadily increase. So your urine osmolality increases, and you can, and just as a side note, uh, you cannot increase your urine osmolality greater than 500 without ADH. So this is this is a very important uh, mechanism for your body to maintain a high urine osmolality, probably uh, the most important, uh, I would say. So this is a uh, general rough idea of the physiology that's important uh, for you to know in order to understand the disease. Now what we're going to do, we're going to go over to each one individually. So uh, the two types that we have is going to be uh, either central or you can have the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So we'll go ahead and we're going to make a column here um, so that we can take each one one by one. So again, with central, uh, the problem is going to be with decreased production by hypothalamus or the posture pituitary. And with the nephrogenic, there's going to be a problem with uh, the response by the kidney. So in nephrogenic, the, the posture pituitary and the hypothalamus are producing and secreting enough ADH. However, the kidney is just not responding the way it should. And so that's where the, the, the problem starts to occur. So let's begin by looking at the different types of causes. So uh, the causes for central, uh, first we're going to take a look at the idiopathic causes. So um, idiopathic, again, it's not known why this occurs, but for some reason in certain patients, uh, there's a sed steady decrease, uh, destruction of hormone releasing cells. And so over time, uh, the the pituitary and the hypothalamus, for one reason or another, is not going to produce enough uh, ADH for the patient to uh, concentrate the urine. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, neurosurgery. So patients who undergo neurosurgery uh, specifically for pituitary adenomas may, as a side effect, uh, have uh, destru you know have uh, destruction to their posture pituitary and then lead to diabetes insipidus subsequently. Uh, the other cause is going to be trauma. So any type of head trauma oftentimes uh, can lead to diabetes insipidus. And this goes in a uh, what's known as a triphasic response. And um, I like to think about it almost like uh, uh, acute tuber necrosis, which also goes in three phases backwards. So if you remember ATN, you have that inciting event, uh, oligoria, and then polyuria. So in this one, it's going to be a little bit backwards because here you have the initial event, which is going to lead to polyuria and you get the polyuria because of dysfunction of the actual pituitary or hypothalamus depending on where the trauma occurred and this occurs for about four to five days um, and then after four to five days what suddenly happens is you get this SIADH phase and SIADH just uh, is a syndrome of inappropriate ADH uh, secretion of inappropriate ADH uh, and so in this phase you have way too much ADH and so here instead of uh, producing too much urine you're suddenly not producing enough urine. And so you're reabsorbing all of the uh, fluid. And so uh, why does this occur? This pretty much the only reason this occurs is because w with trauma, you have destruction of the cells. And when the cells gets destroyed, it begins to, uh, all the st stored hormones be become released. And this happens between days 6 to 11. So on day 6 to 11, 
you get the exact opposite problem. And then this is th this is going to be uh, pretty dangerous because you know when a patient comes with polyuria, hypernatremia, what are you doing? You're restricting uh, so salt and you're giving them uh, more fluids, and then suddenly they have way too much ADH. So they they get uh, uh, a lot of ADH, and so then all that fluid and salt that you've given them. Uh, there's, uh, sorry, the, 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 all the fluid that you've given them and the salt that you restricted, suddenly they can't get rid of the water. And so they, they can actually become uh, hyponatremic. And hyponatremia is very dangerous. So this is a very important thing to keep in mind. And the final phase, which for some reason popped up a little earlier, is called permanent diabetes insipidus. And so, uh, you know, after all that sort of hormones are released and uh, used up, then the patient no longer has any hormones, and so they're going to have diabetes insipidus. Um, after this, uh, some tumors, especially invading tumors, can cause diabetes insipidus. Uh, in particular, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, also known as histiocytosis X, uh, can cause this. Um, about 40% of patients with this condition can, can have uh, diabetes insipidus. Uh, next, uh, there are some congenital syndromes. Um, and so there are some syndromes where, as part of the syndrome, uh, they have um, diabetes insipidus there. So septic, uh, septo-optal uh, dysplasia, also known as SOD, uh, can cause, and this is just basically a defect in the uh, like pituitary and and, all, uh, uh, and and everything in the middle, kind of midline of the uh, face, uh, and also familial uh, uh, central diabetes insipidus. So this is going to be again like a congenital or hereditary syndrome. So this kind of wraps up all the causes of the central uh, diabetes insipidus. Now what we'll do is we'll kind of take a look at nephrogenic causes. So causes here, uh, we'll, we'll first go over is the hereditary causes. So um, in hereditary, you can have a V2 receptor mutation. Um, and so uh, in, in here, uh, the, again, the body's producing uh, enough ADH, but the receptor that it attaches to the V2 receptor is not responding like it's supposed to be, or it's not attaching like it's supposed to be. And so again, you're gonna get a uh, nephrogenic form. And interestingly enough, the V2 receptor gene is located on the X chromosome. So this is an X-linked recessive chromosome. So it'll be more prevalent in males. Um, another mutation, it could be in the actual aquaporin-2 gene. So again, you can be producing the ADH. It's uh, reacting to its uh, receptor perfectly, but the aquaporin is just not working. And this is, can be an autosome recessive or an autosomal dominant trait. Uh, next, and this is probably the most common, uh, which is going to be lithium use. So lithium is used to treat patients with bipolar. Uh, and this bipolar uh, patients, uh, it, it's very effective for them. So it's, it's important that they try to continue. And we'll talk about how to deal with these patients specifically. So what's the pathogenesis? Why would lithium cause diabetes insipidus? Well, it because uh, the principal cells uh, have a uh, channel, which is called the, uh, it's a sodium channel, uh, ENAC, they call it. It's the electrical sodium channel, I believe. Uh, and so let's go back up here to our principal cells. So over here, uh, you have a channel, which is called the ENAC. And so this channel generally is pumping in sodium. Um, and so what happens is lithium will use that channel to go in, and then it goes ahead and blocks the vesicle uh, for the aquaporin-2. So uh, thereby, the patient gets uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus because it's inhibiting the aquaporin-2 channel from going to the membrane. Um, there are electrolyte deficiencies, or sorry, abnormalities, I would say, uh, such as hypercalcemia, uh, which can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, particularly if it's greater than 11 milligrams per deciliter. So in these situations, uh, patients can develop uh, a diabetes insipidus. What's uh, interesting, though, is as soon as you correct the calcium, it's reversible. So the treatment is going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, the other is going to be hypokalemia. So this is going to be, uh, for some reason, low potassium decreases the ADH response. Uh, and these tend to be less severe forms, so not as, not as severe as uh, other times or other, other causes. Uh, next is going to be general renal diseases. So remember, when you have renal disease, that you know, eventually it will affect the cortical uh, uh, collecting ducts. And you know, it's, it's going to cause uh, dysfunction of those uh, cells. So you know, diseases such as, uh, I'll just name a few, autosomal dominant polycystic uh, Polycystic kidney disease, sickle cell disease, and amyloidosis, uh, and again, etc. You can you can name pretty much any pathology that's going to eventually affect the collecting tubule will affect uh, will cause can lead to diabetes insipidus. Uh, next, there are a few drugs. Now, these drugs are interesting because uh, oftentimes these drugs are used to treat uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH, which is the opposite of diabetes insipidus. Um, 
And these are drugs such as like Sidofavir, Foscarnet, which are antivirals used with uh, for cytomegalovirus. You have amphotericin B, uh, demiclocycline, iphosphamide, um, and even you know uh, didanazine, which is again another antiviral. And and there are many more than this. Uh, and what's interesting again is these drugs which cause diabetes insipidus can actually be used to treat uh, SIADH. So int uh, that that keeps it interesting. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, pregnancy. So again, you know, of course. Uh So many pregnant patients uh, are. So many pregnant women, you know, they have the usual complaint of polyuria, and one of the reasons for that is going to be that the fact that when you're pregnant, you do have a sort of decreased response to ADH by the kidneys. So uh, we've that kind of wraps up the discussion about causes. Now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll start talking about symptoms. Now the symptoms um, are going to be. The same whether you're dealing with a, a central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic, uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So here they overlap. So the way I'm going to draw this is going to be uh, in the middle. And so what are the three primary symptoms you're going to see? It's going to be polyuria, which means too much urination. Polydipsia, which means uh, excessive thirst or drinking too much water. And finally, uh, nocturia. And of course, nocturia is kind of similar to polyuria. The, the only reason I believe people tend to mention it separately is because this is going to be your presenting complaint. So patients with um, uh, patients, you know, if they're drinking a lot of water, urinating a lot, they can kind of ignore that for a while. Uh, however, if they're urinating in bed, um, you know, they're going to come right away because that's something that they don't want uh, to have occurring. You know. So, uh, so these are going to be three symptoms, uh, and it's as simple as that. So whenever you're reading a vignette in any test, you see this, you definitely want to start at least taking of diabetes insipidus. Uh, another thing that you can look for is going to be hypernatremia. Um, now, here's the issue with hypernatremia. Um, most patients uh, actually, because they're drinking, they have a polydipsia, they can actually maintain a normal sodium level. Uh, it might be on the high side of normal, or it might be just a little bit above normal, but they should be able to maintain it. The only time they won't be able to maintain it is either there's something wrong with the thirst center in their in, of their brain where they don't even feel thirsty, or you know they have uh, decreased access to water. And of course, you know pretty much in this day and age, everybody has access to water. Uh, this would cover more, uh, you know, patients who are very elderly, bedridden, uh, who can't get a glass of water, and maybe infants and children. Uh, who you know can't speak up and just go get, grab a glass of water themselves. So th these are the types of patients that you generally tend to see um, the hypernatremia in. So again, you know, pretty brief uh, symptoms. Um, now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start having a discussion about uh, treatment. And with treatments, uh, we're going to discuss them se separately. So we will begin with uh, taking a look at the treatment for central diabetes insipidus. So central diabetes insipidus, the treatment is pretty straightforward. So you know the patient is not producing enough ADH. So what you can do is you can just go ahead and give them desmopressin, uh, which is an ADH analog, and that tends to take care of the problem pretty, pretty well. Uh, there are some other drugs that you might, may want to use depending on other comorbidities that the patient may have. This could be like chlorpropamide, which is going to be used for uh, diabetes mellitus. Um, you can also have, use carbamazepine, uh, anti-seizure, uh, clofibrate, which is going to be anti-hyperlipidemic. And you can use NSAIDs. And so the mechanism of action is with chlorpropamide and uh, carbamazepine, it increases the responsiveness uh, for ADH. Uh, clofibrate actually increases the secretion of ADH. And interestingly enough, uh, prostaglandins uh, is actually an ADH antagonist. So by giving NSAIDs, you decrease the amount of prostaglandins, which is going to decrease the uh, antagonism of ADH. So uh, that, was a, that was an interesting point that I uh, discovered recently, actually. Um, Finally, what you also want to do is you want to put the patient on a special diet, a what's called what's known as a low solute diet. Low solute diet consists of a diet of low sodium and low protein. So why would you want to do this? So, so to understand this uh, theoretically, uh, you have to understand that patients with diabetes insipidus have a fixed urine osmolality. So you know they cannot increase their uh, urine osmolality over a given point. So, for example, let's just say there's a patient, uh, he has diabetes mellitus, and he can't increase his urine osmolality above 150. So, if this patient um, has a, so let's just say, uh, a plasma osmolality of 750, it requires 5 liters of urine 
to bring it back down to normal or, or to, to get rid of the, all that excess solute. On the other hand, if that same patient has uh, a, plasma, a plasma, plasma osmolality of 450, then only 3 liters of urine is required to remove that excess solute. So by limiting the amount of solute that's, that the, the, the individual is taking, you can drastically limit the amount of urine required to remove that solute. So this is also a, kind of an adjunctive uh, treatment along with your desmopressin and maybe the other drugs uh, if they're taking them. But again, if you just remember desmopressin, that's going to be your primary uh, treatment modality. So now that we've talked about essential diabetes insipidus, let's go ahead and switch our focus to um, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Uh, so um, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, uh, the, again, we're talking about there's going to be uh, some issue with the kidney not responding. So one of the treatments that we can give is actually a diuretic, um, the uh, thiazide diuretic. And this can actually be uh, kind of confusing, right? Because you're thinking the pa patient is already urinating too much. Why give him something that going to cause them to urinate even more. Uh, and so the logic behind using a thiazide diuretic is that um, th any type of volume depletion, uh, so when the, when, the, when the body experiences any type of volume depletion, this increases your sodium and water reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubules. So the way you want to think about it is you're taking the focus off of the cortical uh, co uh, collecting ducts and you're putting it onto the pro proximal convoluted tubule. So now you're reabsorbing in this area rather than reabsorbing in the collecting duct. Now, how effective is this? Well, even a one kilogram loss of, of volume depletion can decrease your urine flow by 50%. So this is actually a fairly effective way, and this is why thiazides is the mainstay of treatment. Uh, another treatment that uh, you can consider, depending on what the situation the patient is going through, is amiloride. Now, amiloride is uh, a, a sodium channel inhibitor. Uh, the ENAC that we talked about uh, inhibitor. And um, this is primarily used for patients who are on lithium. Now, if you remember, when we, we, when we came back here, um, the, the lithium uses this channel to, to enter the principal cell and then inhibit the aquaporins here. So when you use amiloride, you block this channel and so lithium cannot even enter here. And this allows patients who are using lithium to continue using lithium to treat, you know, whatever they have, uh, they're, they're treating, for example, bipolar. Um, also, these patients, uh, whether they're nephrogenic or central diabetes insipidus, you do want to, uh, you know, recommend the same uh, sort of low-solute diet. So, low-solute diet is good for both of them. And then another point that I wanted to make, which is also very important, is you do not want to give loop diuretics. Uh, you might, some people may be thinking that, hey, if thiazides help, uh, well, loop diuretic is a much stronger diuretic than thiazide, so this should help even more. But no, you don't want to do that. And the reason is, is because you got to go back to the mechanism of action. So remember, loop diuretics are going to act on the two sodium, uh, sorry, sodium chloride, two potassium channels. This is required to maintain this osmotic gradient over here. Uh, and so if you don't maintain the osmotic gradients, um, then the less water is going to be reabsorbed. So in a way, by giving a loop diuretic, you're making it, you're making the kidneys less responsive to ADH, and that can actually make things worse, not better. Okay, so now that we've uh, talked about uh, the treatment, um, now what I want to do is go ahead and talk about how you would diagnose uh, a patient with uh, with these conditions and differentiate between uh, central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So in order to diagnose diabetes insipidus accurately. Uh, you must differentiate between three different conditions. Um, the first two we've already discussed, so that's going to be your central diabetes insipidus and your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The third one is called primary polydipsia. And so we haven't discussed this yet, but primary polydipsia is a patient who has a constant urge to drink water. Uh, so they're constantly thirsty, uh, and they just keep drinking water even though they already have enough water. And so the way I like to differentiate this is the two types of uh, diabetes insipidus is a problem with too much water loss, whereas with primary polydipsia is going to be water overload. So they're just drinking way too much water, and so that's why they're urinating. The reason, the reason these three must be differentiated is because their symptoms are identical. You're going to have uh, polyuria, polydipsia, and the nocturia. Um, initially, with labs, it, it is it, labs are usually enough to differentiate differentiate at least the diabetes insipidus from the primary polydipsia. With diabetes insipidus, again, you have that high or normal high uh, 
to the serum sodium where and with the low urine osmolality was water overload because you're drinking so much water you have low serum sodium and low urine osmolality so the serum sodium is oftentimes enough to help you differentiate that but even then um, if you say for example you, you still can't determine it there is a test uh, known as the water restriction test and the water restriction test is a fairly simple straightforward test where you just restrict water so the patient can have no water whatsoever and then you monitor four different values you monitor the urine volume urine osmolality the plasma sodium and the plasma osmolality and so once you restrict the water you start measuring these you measure the urine volume and the urine osmolality every hour and you measure the uh, plasma sodium and the plasma osmolality every two hours so you do you go through this process uh, and you try to see how the uh, these the urine osmolality and the plasma plasma osmolality change over time with the patient having no water whatsoever. And so to help understand how to uh, interpret the results, it's actually helpful to see uh, what should happen in a normal patient who has no disease uh, whatsoever. So in a normal patient, um, if you decrease the water, um, immediately their plasma osmolality will go up. And so an increase in plasma plasma osmolality activates the hypothalamus to start secreting ADH. ADH, again, via the V2 receptors, will start reabsorbing water, so you get an increase in urine osmolality. So this is the general process uh, of what you'd expect a normal person to go through. Now, what we will be looking at, uh, measuring, is going to be the plasma osmolality and the urine osmolality. So these are your two that, that we're measuring. And of course, uh, we're also measuring the urine volume, and so the urine volume is expected to be lower. And before we continue, let me make a quick point about the plasma osmolality. So the plasma osmolality, once it increases to about 295, uh, 300 milliosmoles, ADH at that moment is having its maximum effect that it can. So therefore, um, even if you add more, say for example, desmopressin, which is an ADH analog, even if you add that, it should have no extra effect in a normal person. Of course, this is a normal person, and so that's why this is going to help us, uh, by administering desmopressin, we'll be able to differentiate some different types of diabetes, uh, diabetes insipidus, uh, and we'll go over that right now. I'm going to represent the interpretation of this result is by making a little table. So uh, in this table, uh, we're going to show uh, the hours on top. So for example, this is the first hour after uh, water restriction was initiated, uh, second hour after water, water restriction was initiated, and third hour after water uh, restriction was initiated. Then after the third hour, we're going to imagine we give the patient desmopressin. So after third hour, they receive desmopressin. And for example, this is going to be the fourth column, where, uh, which was going to represent four hours after water restriction was initiated. So we're going to go ahead and make this table. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and input some values. And then we're going to see, depending on how the values are changing, uh, what, what we would diagnose it as. So let's just say we have a patient, we start restricting water. Uh, in the first hour, he has a urine osmolality of 210. In the second hour, urine osmolality is 210. So it didn't change, even though with water restriction. So this is right away going to tell you there's some issue because you would expect a steady increase in urine osmolality. Uh, in the third hour, uh, only 210, which is very small. Um, and so we've noticed that there's very little, if any, increase in urine osmolality, even though the patient uh, is being water restricted. And so then we go ahead, we'll give them the desmopressin, and let's calculate, let's see what the urine osmolality is then. So let's just say it bumps up to 570. So there's a drastic change after desmopressin. So the change is very high, right? Almost more than, uh, greater than 100%. So when you see this uh, type of scenario where uh, water restriction does not have any effect on the urine osmolality and suddenly desmopressin does, then this means that the patient is just lacking ADH. And so as long as they have ADH, they'll be able to normally um, increase their urine osmolality. And so this you can diagnose as uh, central diabetes insipidus. So uh, the, th the two features of uh, central diabetes insipidus is uh, water restriction does not uh, increase the urine osmolality and desmopressin will increase the urine osmolality greater than 100%. So that's going to be for central diabetes insipidus. Now let's take another scenario. Uh, same thing. So you got 210, 210, 220. So again, we're seeing, wait a minute, the patient is not able to increase the urine osmolality. Then you give them desmopressin and let's just see what happens. 
230. So they went up, but not not the same jump here. So would you still say it's uh, central diabetes insipidus? No, because with central diabetes insipidus, it should increase more than 100%. So this was an increase of less than 10%. And so if the increase is less than 10%, then that's diagnostic of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So this means the patient is releasing ADH. So they do have that maximum effect of ADH. Uh, but it's the kidneys that, that, that are having the issues. The kidneys are not responding. So you can give as much desmopresin as you want. It'll have no effect. Now let's, let's give a third scenario. In this case, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, you're, you know, the patient is being water restricted and he still can't uh, increase... Uh, his urine osmolality. And then when you give him desmopressin, he bumps up to about 300. Now this can be confusing because you can say, wait a minute, that was a decent response. It wasn't as good as a complete central diabetes uh, syphilis response. So um, this is going to be, you know, within the range of 15 to 50% response. And in those, we call that partial uh, central diabetes uh, insipidus. And so uh, you, can ha you can have, so in this scenario, the patient was producing ADH, but only a little bit and so when you gave him desmopressin, that, that bumped him up a little bit more. So, uh, and, and in general, it is some, sometimes difficult to diagnose the difference between partial and nephrogenic. So the cutoff is, is between 10% and 15 to 15%, but still it can be difficult. Now, uh, let's give a final scenario. So um, let me just kind of extend this here. So let's just say there's another patient. He starts off with a water restriction. In the first hour, it's 210. Second hour, goes up to 450. Third hour, it goes up to 600. So what are you noticing here? The urine osmolality is slowly increasing. And this is what you'd expect. And actually, if you ever see a urine osmolality of 600, uh, that means that ADH is normal and the kidney is responding normally. And if you give desmopressin, what would you expect? 600. Again, desmopressin is having no effect. Why? Because ADH is already having its maximum effect. So adding desmopressin shouldn't do anything more. So... The, the two features that you notice here is first, there's going to be a steady increase in urine osmolality and there's no change after desmopressin. This is actually what you'd find in a normal patient, but you can also find these uh, findings in a patient with primary polydipsia. Because in the patient with primary polydipsia, remember, their kidneys are completely normal. It's just that they're constantly drinking water. It's just that water overload state that's causing them to uh, have constant urination and constant thirst. So I uh, hope you found this video uh, helpful, uh, just kind of went over diabetes insipidus and how to diagnose it, and I'll see you in a future video. See you later, guys. Bye.